So when David asked me to write a piece for Kronos's 50 for the Future, it was a really exciting thing for me to think about because, of course, I reflected on the 20 years I spent with the group and all the amazing things that I learned in that time. Since then, I started composing, and largely because of the fact that I wanted to keep involved in music, and I had learned so much from all these composers that Kronos worked with that it seemed a natural thing for me to step into. So in writing this piece, I thought, okay, it's a seven-minute piece. You know, I can't cover all the stuff I learned in those 20 years, but there's some things that I thought were very important that I think every quartet should think about when they approach a piece and when they play all together as a group. I mean, I learned tons of things that were about sound and rhythm and pitch, phrasing, um, character, you know. So I tried to incorporate these into basically what a lot of people would call sound effects because there's so many sounds an instrument like ours can make and so many different ways of making those sounds. And when you're in music school, a lot of times, you know, you're taught how to make a really good sound and play in tune and all this stuff. But then it goes way beyond that when you're in a group like Kronos because everything that you do becomes really significant. So I wrote this piece and I started it with hitting the instrument. I called the piece knock. And for me, you know, even if you knock on your instrument and make a percussive sound, there's millions of ways you can do it. So the important thing for me is that every quartet should experiment and decide what seems appropriate to them for that piece of music and how, which the best way is to present that idea across to an audience. So even in this first section, and I'm gonna have um, John and Sonny demonstrate some of this, but so, it starts with knocks on the instrument. And the thing is, it starts with each person doing a series of knocks. And to me, like the first knock, the, and this is where character and phrasing comes into play, even when you're just hitting your instrument, kind of just like saying somebody knocks on the door. And then the next knock is like more of a question knock. <laughs> and then the next knock is okay, that person didn't hear me, so I'm gonna get a little more insistent. And then the fourth series of knocks is like, okay, I'm here, open the door. <laughs> so even in that short period of time, to me, there's a lot of character and phrasing that goes along with something as simple as hitting your instrument. So I'm gonna have John do an example of some of these taps. Okay, you know, it's interesting because my very first taps that I have are in a very soft character. Hank starts with the first one that's loud and then I respond in a soft character. And we were thinking, you know, what's, what's the best way to, to get this type of sound? And, you know, it's like anything else. It's like, you know, if you're thinking of playing an up bow, you, know, you wanna get the right articulation. And with a tap, you also wanna get the, the, the musical articulation for it. And kind of what I came up with, so Hank would, would go very loud, Bum, and then I respond. So I, I, I'm hitting it with my two fingers right here, hitting it right on the side of the instrument right here. I almost think a little bit of heartbeat. Bum, bum. And what happens with my part towards the end of the knocks is that they get louder and louder. And what I really want to make clear to all of the instrumentalists who are doing the knocks this doesn't hurt the instrument at all. You know, it may sound like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? But it doesn't hurt it at all. We've been doing this for years and years and years and my instrument is in great condition. Um, in fact, also, you know, for any instruments who are instrumentalists who are worried about this, you know, if think about it, if you go to a luthier and you may have an issue where maybe your instrument has become unglued, what does a luthier do? They go there and they usually check the sides to see where it's open and how do they check it. I've seen luthiers, they go like this and they're listening to a very certain sound and when it's open it makes a more hollow sound, but they hit it so hard, you know, 
they hit it really, really loud. And that's a luthier doing that, and they have no qualms about it. So don't, don't worry about it. So I'm going to do some crescendos. And kind of as you notice what I'm kind of doing, I kind of start hovering when I'm doing it softly, it's hovering. And as I'm getting louder, you notice I'm kind of going back to get more force. So and again, it's really something that, you know, everybody's individual knocks. We've all thought about very carefully the technique of doing it and the musicality of doing it. And after this knocking section, there comes a section where I'm thinking about glissandos. And so Sonny starts really low and does a glissando, then Hank comes in, then John and David. And the whole point is, is that it should sound really seamless and that it builds, it starts out super soft and then gets super loud. <laughs> and then when they get to the loud part, they use a tremolo. So again, all these are sort of standard effects, if you will glissando, tremolo, but they can be so effective in, and so that's why I included them in this section. Then right after that, there's a section that I really like because it reminds me of the Arvo Perrot piece, Fratres, that I did with Kronos. And I always loved the fact that John held this drone, which is a really hard thing to do, to hold a drone really, really soft and have it always be there, but it's sort of um, supporting everything else in a way. And then the cello had a really cool um, percussive sound that you would hit the strings right above the bridge, really. And again, a lot of this stuff, you know, you can experiment and see what sounds best on your instrument. But I'm going to have Sonny demonstrate this tapping on the bridge or string right above the bridge that's um, in this next section when John is holding the drone. So in this section where John is holding the drone and Sonny is hitting that percussive sound close to her bridge, David is playing harmonics and Hank is playing sol ponticello. Again, these are two different sounds, but they should sound each unique. They shouldn't sound, you're not trying to make them sound the same way, but you're trying to make them sound that they're in the same world, but they're slightly different. So David's, I think, is much more open because it's the harmonics, and then Hank's because it's the sol ponticello is a little bit edgier. But anyhow, again, basically what I'm talking about is you've got four different sounds going on at the same time, which is the point. So everybody is distinct and individual, but it all works together. And then we go on to the next section. And the next section is just really brief and it's experimenting with pizzicato. And of course, there's a million different ways you can pizzicato. And I always find that it's really too bad that when you're learned, when you're taught how to play pizzicato, it's sort of like, oh, you just pluck the string. Well, then when I was in Kronos, I realized, well, man, there's a million different ways you can pluck that string. And so even though this is only very short, there's, I try to incorporate the fact that you can play really close to the bridge, or you can play a snap pitch where, it, you know, you hit the fingerboard, you pull the string up so hard it hits the fingerboard. Or you can play really super soft and you can play with the, your thumb. And so that's the thing. You can play a pizzicato in so many different places on your string and with so many different parts of your finger and whatever finger you have that you want to use. Um, they'll all create different sounds. And so you, again, you just have to experiment and figure out what's the best sound for that section. So one of the pizzicato techniques is that we use the thumb, actually. And actually, we, we push it this way. And you notice the thumb, it's thicker. You know, there's more flesh there. And so that should affect the pizzicato sound. 
In other words, if I just do it the normal way, and now hopefully with the thumb going this way, you can pull it a little more, and it's, it's subtly, subtly different. Very subtle, but yet there is a difference. And another one that I have is a Ponticello pizzicato. And it's like playing Arco Ponticello with the bow, where you're very, very close to the bridge. And this one, I anchor it. And it's interesting to get closer to the bridge. My technique that I figured out is that I anchor it actually on the bridge right here. And then I go right up very, very close. And I go. So it's a very steely. That kind of a sound. And two things I guess you'd have to be a little bit careful of. As you notice, I'm anchoring it on the bridge. Make sure you're not pushing it too hard because you don't obviously want to push the bridge. So just kind of gently anchor it, anchor it and then So for snap pits, you grab the string with two fingers. It can be any two you prefer. And you pull it, you grab it and pull it outwards and release. So. After moving on in the piece after that section of pizzicatos, it goes to fairly standard stuff. However, um, it's really important that, I, you know, this next section, um, the contrast again is, is always really important. And, you know, the stroke between the really short stroke that John and David would be doing, the two violins, and the stroke that um, ch the cello and viola are doing, uh, which is much more tenuto or on the string or um, into the string, and so it's a heavier stroke. Whereas the, the violins are, are sort of the short, kind of uh, instigating, you know, background, but then the main thing is, is the viola and the cello. Um, and so that, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, then the next section, it goes on to where the, the violins trade off. Uh, they have a figure that goes back and forth, which is a standard thing for string quartets, I think, to learn is that how you can have uh, almost one line, but have it played by two different instruments. So that passing off from one instrument to the next and back and forth is really important. So that even though it's two different instruments playing, you can almost make it sound like one line. Um, and then underneath that, you have uh, the viola and cello are playing um, Pizzicato, or, or then later they do Collegno, and it is important to get across the fact that it sort of feels like, is it in two or is it in three? Um, so I really, I learned so much about rhythm when I was in Kronos, and I think that's a really cool thing when, when you have this two against three. <clears throat> and it's not real clear in a, in a sense, but I think when the player is playing it, they should feel that. They should feel... Um, basically, the the violins will, you know, almost sound like they're in a big two, da 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 ba da 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 ba da da, and then the viola and the uh, cello are more like da 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 more in three. So that's just good to keep in mind when you're playing that section. And then if we move on from there, uh, well, actually, in that section, the viola and cello, they go from playing pizzicato to collegno, uh, battuto. And so the collegno battuto, of course, is when you hit the string. So it doesn't sound like pizzicato, but it's kind of related in that it is percussive, but more percussive than a pizzicato even. So it again, you're, well, I'm just talking about different sound qualities and and, you, you know, so I think that's a good thing to think about when you're playing it. It's like, uh, how can you make these different sounds um, and make them sound interesting and contrasting? Uh, okay, and so then, <laughs> after that, we go to uh, the section where there's a lot of going from sul tasto, which is when you play really close up 
on the fingerboard, and then when you move down and play Ponticello, um, which is really close to the bridge. And of course, the difference in sound is, is Soltasto is really delicate and um, very beautiful, soft sound. And then when you go down to Ponticello, it gets to be very reedy and harsh and, you know, kind of a not as pretty of a sound. <laughs> so the whole point with this section is how to learn to really play from one to the next. And so you, you know, you can practice that for hours. <laughs> you can go from sol, uh, sol tosto and then just keep going down to sol panicello and then back up again. And so the thing is, is that you can control that and you have a lot of control going back from one to the next. Um, so that's a lot of what this whole next, next section is. And then of course there's a little cello figure because, you know, I'm a cellist and I can't help it put a little cello line in there. So the cello becomes the most important thing at that point. <laughs> um, and then at the end of that, there is also, you know, when it's everybody is together and playing the same thing, then um, you guys, the, the quartet, all of them add vibrato, which again is a thing Kronos experimented with a lot, whereas, you know, non-vibrato as opposed to vibrato and the difference that makes in the sound. And then this section, it's swelling towards the end, and so I think the addition of vibrato just makes it much more um, thick and and sort of exciting, you know, as, as opposed to when it's non-vibrato and it's a little bit more um, subdued sounding. So that's the point of adding the vibrato in that section. So it kind of like drives to the end, and adding the vibrato just helps you do that. Um, then there's this brief little bar that's kind of a transition, but um, where Sonny has a, the cello has a collegno hit where, and you have, it's, you have to really hit it hard because you want to cover all four strings and you only have that one whack to do it in. So you have to really, um, and you have to figure out where on your string is the best place to do that. Of course, you don't want to be down too close to the bridge because you won't hit all four strings. When you're closer up to sol tosto, it, the strings are a little looser, so you can actually hit all four strings at once. But in order for it be, to be loud, you have to be pretty forceful with that hit. And then Hank has a, the violist has a gliss that goes up, and then John, uh, second violin, has this uh, little figure that's playing behind the bridge, and then Hank, and then uh, David has a figure that then becomes sort of constant throughout this next section, where he dampens his strings with his left hand, and he plays uh, on the strings, but it becomes like a uh, sound that actually, when we played a piece by Astor Piazzolla, and his uh, violinist did this sound that was really incredible and that's where the sound comes from. Another aspect to getting this sound in a, in a really musical way is that your left hand, if you put it on the strings and kind of dampen very lightly the four strings, not a pitch but damped lightly and then just go So another aspect to executing this sound in the real musical way that you'd like to is that the amount of pressure that you use on the bow. You don't, it's, it's not light, you're going to be pushing, you're going to be pressing and kind of pressing the sound. In fact, you notice how I'm holding the bow. I'm holding it like this so I get more pressure. This is the cello part in bar 119, uh, Colenio Battuto. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, the viola part also in 119. This is the effect for bar 120 in the V2 part. And I love this effect because it's very, very dramatic. And it goes like this. It's behind the bridge. <laughs> and 
And one thing that you have to be very careful of, a lot of violins are going to have their mutes on. And you just have to be very careful that the mute isn't too close to the bridge, that it's not hovering here. Because when you put the bow there, ah, there's your mute. So just make sure that the, that the mute is far back, and then you have all this space to work with. This is the high cello harmonic notes in bar, well, pick up to 123. After that section, it comes to the, the very end, um, and for this last section, I really referenced a piece that I absolutely adore, that the Kronos played um, many times, and it's by Witold Ludoslavsky, and it's his string quartet. This is his only string quartet. And it was really interesting the way he notated things. There was one section in particular which I thought was really effective, and that section is actually the inspiration for this l very last part of the piece. And he had each member of the group play exactly the same line, but they would play it independently and very freely. So there was really no beat involved, and it was just really interesting to me how this all overlaps. And so that's what I'm trying to create in this last section. And so when I've written um, freely, not together, that is very much the case. But basically, you follow somebody's, when they, uh, entrances are, are followed, when, when someone comes in that you know, oh, okay, I can come in now. And then, so it, you, you do have to realize what everybody else is doing or where they come in. But once somebody enters and it cues you, then when you see where they are and then you know, okay, after they play this note, I can come in. And then that just continues throughout the whole quartet and eventually everybody's playing. And then finally one person, you just hold a note and everybody ends on that note. Um, but to me, that this section is sort of, it's kind of improvisation. I mean, it is improvisation, but it's written out improvisation. But it really leaves it up to the player. And, you know, you're responding to everybody else who's playing, but you're also very independent. And I just found that concept very appealing. <laughs> and um, so that's what this last section is about. It does sort of wrap up the whole piece. And it hopefully is a conclusion that... Uh, it's interesting in the fact that it's like here you've got these four players, but you know they're all you, you guys are all independent, um, but you're but still you're all playing together. So which is the great thing about playing in a quartet, you know you you have this camaraderie between everyone and you depend on everyone, but then hopefully you can also express yourself at the same time. So basically. That's what this last section is about, and you should just enjoy it and have fun.